Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out here this morning, and also good morning to all those that are watching via the Facebook this morning and also YouTube. We appreciate you guys taking this time out to worship with our Lord, and uh, we're all together in spirit, even if we can't physically all be together. Uh, announcements. Does anybody have an announcement that needs to be made at this time? Because I don't have any right off. All right, if not, then I'm going to ask that you stand and wave to the people across the way and say, Good morning. Good to have you in church. trust in you and to just draw close to you and to one another as much as we're able. Heavenly Father, for those who are sick, we pray for their healing. For those who are struggling right now with life and the circumstances that uh, out there that are, are so oppressive, we pray for strength. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are grieving, uh, that have lost, they have lost a loved one, and we pray for their comfort. We pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts this morning, that you will open up the Scripture to us, and that we can draw strength from your Word. We are grateful, Lord, for your loving kindness and patience with us. And we pray, O oh Lord, for the passing of these days of uh, tribulation and difficulties, but that we will be refined in our faith and strong in our resolve and in our belief in you. Let us take every opportunity, Lord, to share the good news with everyone that we meet along the way. Let us be a sensitive people that are meeting needs of those that are struggling with uh, the creature comforts of home and food and things that are necessary. Lord, let the ministry of the church continue to thrive and increase in this hour in which so badly this world needs a message of hope. Open up our hearts this morning to encourage us as we try to look at a scripture that teaches us how to trust in you when we are being tested. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. This morning we have a special uh, song that uh, a member of our church had uh, uh, wanted to have played this morning, so I'm going to get out of the way and we're all going to listen. Thank you. 
Wonderful song. Thank you so much. I love that song. I bless it. This morning, our, uh, does it sound good at this? Is this a little loud? Or is it just a little loud? Okay. Our scripture lesson comes out of Hebrews. Hebrews is an interesting book. If you ever want to draw some strength uh, during times of uncertainty and in times of danger, Hebrews is the book to go to because it is a, it's a letter that uh, is attributed to the Apostle Paul, even though there's a debate on whether or not he actually wrote it or did he outline something and others wrote it. But nonetheless, it was inspired by God uh, to uh, teach the church in a time where tribulation and hardship was a was a regular occurrence. It wasn't something that just came one time, uh, you know, unaware. Uh, the people of faith in that day, every day was a day of uncertainty. Uh, just the socioeconomic and the cultural norms of the time were so different than what they are here now. And, uh, you know, they weren't caught unaware, like I guess in America and the world, with a virus that just overnight seemed to take control and grip the entire planet, not just one nation, but an entire planet. And so, you know, it's throwing us off balance. It's uh, testing us, isn't it? How many of you feel tested over the last four to five months? You know, your faith is being tested. Your resolve and belief has been tested. Um, that's why I chose this chapter and this passage this morning, and I believe the Lord led me to this, and I'm not just saying that, I really do, uh, for us to look at what uh, and how do we face the testing? How do we learn how to trust God? You know, we have the old hymn, trust and obey, but there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And there is a lot to be said about knowing how to trust in God. And so let's just look at chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter. Therefore we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to, to, to us by those who heard it. While God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and and through whom all things exist in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters, and in the midst of the congregation I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am, here am I, 
and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has had power of death, and that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that they might be there might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. And so is the reading of God's holy word. You know the story. A creation is a beautiful story because it's a story of how God, as an act of love, created all life and all things for humanity. He created man first, and then he created woman. And those days in that beginning time were a time of great perfection. The garden was a beautiful place, and man was given dominion over all the living things on the earth. And he walked perfectly with God. Now Satan, who was Lucifer, who was in heaven, the most beautiful angel of all, fell from grace. He was thrown out of heaven. And Satan intruded the garden. And in that garden, the Lord God warned man, warned Adam, do not eat from that tree. For the lure of that tree would catch the eye of Eve. And then later, Adam would consent, and together they would disobey God. We know the story, the fall of humanity. It is at that point when all things changed. It was at that point that something was introduced into the garden that had never been there before. See, before there was nothing but life. Before there was no death. Before there was perfection. Before there was a perfect will of God was being carried out in his creation. It was what we dream of for heaven someday, where there's no sin, there's no pain, there's no fear. None of those things existed in the beginning. But because of the one act of disobedience and seeking power, then the guard became corrupted. And so humanity has been corrupted ever since. One thing I have learned in this scripture, and one thing that I think we all know as Christian people is, what did Jesus bring to the world? Did he bring just signs and wonders? Did he bring just miracles and stories and narratives? Did he bring just a wonderful moral teaching? What Christ brought to this world is life. That's exactly right. He brought to this world life in the midst of death. What is it to attribute to Satan? What is the greatest attribute that Satan has ever given to this world is death. He is the author of death. In Christ there is life. Yes. With Satan there's death. What is the greatest fear of humanity? If we were honest, this morning, this is not a hard question to answer. What is our greatest fear? Death, isn't it? Oh, we might be assured of our faith because we have, we're believers, we read the scriptures, we pray, we have a peace in our heart that there is something greater, but really and truly, honestly, none of us are separated from a certain fear of death. When this virus hit the world, what was the one thing that this virus did is it shook humanity with the threat of death. And so what happens is we will do anything to avoid it. We will be obedient, compliant. We will do anything to avoid death. People have been fighting death for every generation. 
We're constantly trying to be younger. We want to relive our youth. We want to regain that physical strength that we once had when we were younger. And then our legs continue to get weaker. And it's frustrating, isn't it? There are some of us who will have plastic surgery, so we look younger. But that body's still getting older. And you're just one day closer to what? Death. There are people that do, do not face death well at all. There are family members that have lost loved ones to death, and they'll not even enter into a chapel of a funeral home or a church somewhere for a funeral. They don't do funerals, they say. I've met these people. I just don't do funerals. All that is is that they don't want to face death. They don't want to face their own mortality. It is a hard thing to face. We can't stay there long, even in our discussions, because it is so frightening to us. The unknown. Even though the Bible teaches us all these things, we have to admit there's a certain amount of fear that goes along with it. The Apostle Paul was certain of life eternal, but he was sitting in a cell, he was going to be beheaded, he was going to be, die, and he knew that it was coming and there was no escape. That has to be an overwhelming feeling, just like we talked about John the Baptist was overwhelmed, I think, physically. When we suffer, it is hard to suffer. It's hard to hurt. So we fear it, we avoid it, we push it aside, we try to change it. We think that somehow science someday is going to give us the magic pill that's going to keep us from the enemy itself of death. And it will not. It's once appointed for a man to die. We will die. How do we face it? How do we face these days? How do we face these long days of uncertainties? You know, I think maybe one of the hardest things as a Christian sometimes is learning how to trust God. It's a hard lesson to learn. Amen. You know, we, we can trust Him in our minds, but there are those times it's like everything we ever believed and everything that we've ever heard taught about trusting God just goes right out the window when we're faced with the enemy of death. Fear takes over. Reaction takes over. We panic. All of a sudden, what we had before with the peace in our heart has just been disrupted. And what do we do? Is we run and we want to hide, just like Adam and Eve. What is it that we are afraid of? Maybe it's leaving our loved ones. Maybe it is things are going to change now. And I don't really have the clearest picture of how and what. I have a little image of it, but I just can't process in my mind what eternity is like past his life. We really can't. We desire it in our souls. Jesus died for it so that you could have it as a reality. But we just look through that mirror dimly and we just cannot place a lot of our security on what that's going to be like. And what if I made a mistake along the way? What if I got it wrong? Then we start to doubt ourselves. What if I did not pray the right prayer or I should have done this? Then we start to count that game of how we're going to work our way into God's favor. These are all traps that we fall into. Probably two of the most dangerous traps for a believer is indifference and neglect. Amen. When we become indifferent about faith, maybe we just won't talk about it, I'm not going to face it, I'm not going to look at it, I'm not going to even talk about it, don't even bring God up to me. I'll do with it my way. I'm just going to hang with it my way, however I see fit. Now you have that choice. But if you say that you believe in God, and you never open a Bible, you never really spend time in really intentional prayer, 
You never have any desire whatsoever to worship him. You just sort of deal with him as life goes along on your own timing. That's neglect. Amen. It's neglecting what's most important in your life. You put all your energy and all your focus on raising your family, having a career, making sure you have everything set up for retirement, building your home, having a second home, making sure that all things are provided of the creature comforts of the world, and yet your spirit is starving for some peace. And we're trying to replace that with things that we possess and have. It's an easy trap, folks, and we've all fallen into it at one time or another. How do we keep from neglecting our souls? Maybe the greatest fear in this whole thing has been that very reason. The church has been so busy recreating what we're supposed to do instead of really listening to what God would have us do. We've been building our kingdoms, but we're not building the kingdom of heaven. If we don't agree with something in the scripture, we just change it. After all, we're so much smarter than first century. It's amazing how we neglect things. And we're all guilty of doing it. So don't sit there and say, well, I'm glad he's not talking to me this morning. <laughs> I am talking to you this morning. I promise you, you were on my mind, Scott, when I did this prayer and this, and this sermon. I promise you. All week long, I'm thinking, what can I do to really whip Scott apart right there in that church? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's funny how that works, isn't it? When we neglect and we become indifferent, then we become numb to the Holy Spirit of God. We can't hear God. We shut Him out. Because the only voice we hear is our own. I often wonder, why did Eve give in? Why? You have paradise. You have everything provided. <laughs> It is the most perfect of all places. Heaven on earth. Why did Adam and Eve give in? The lure of power. The very thing, same thing that lured Lucifer to rebel against God in heaven. The lure of power. If you don't believe that the lure of power is probably the number one most dangerous sin, just look at the political arena today. What will people do to be elected? Local, state, federal. This is as close to law politics you'll ever hear me preach from a pulpit. But just look at the nature of people. I'm just not talking about parties here. I'm talking about the nature of people. What will they do for power? Anything. Absolutely, there are no rules. There's, there's nothing moral here. There's not a right or wrong. Ethics is gone. There's no guilt or shame. I'll do what it takes. Eve and Adam in the garden had everything, and yet they still failed. Why is it that we think we would do any different? We, we would, and we don't. But God has made a way, He's made a provision, because what is at stake when we fall into these traps of indifference, neglect, and then trying to just manipulate our faith? What, are, what is at stake here? Life and death. That's what's at stake. The Bible is talking in Hebrews about the angels and the place of angels and where they are, in, in line of God's purpose on this earth and that when humanity came that they were less they were just a little less than the angels but they would be greater than the angels when you die and that Jesus left heaven the son of God and he became human yeah. lower than the angels 
This is the Son of God. And he became so human that he called you and I brother and sister. He walked among us. He lived as a human on the earth. And he followed the perfect will of God at the same time. What a miracle story is that? He is the first human being in all of creation to walk on this planet and live in God's perfect will. None before and none after have ever succeeded. And yet we still question whether or not he is the Son of God. We still say, well, he was just a prophet or a teacher or a bad man, some people call him. The angels' job were to be messengers, to be obedient messengers of God. When they, when they came to the earth to announce the coming of Jesus Christ on this earth as a baby, what did they say? They said, rejoice! The angels were praising him. For salvation is coming to the world. Why does God love us so? When we don't love him. That amazes me. All through history, irregardless of what age you came up in and lived and died, or if you're, you're here now, how does God love us so? When we continue to do the same things over and over and over, we fall to the same lies and the same sins. It's like we never learn our lesson. But yet he loves us so. Oh, bless his name. How does he do that? Because he is perfect in love as the devil is corrupted in evil. He is the per perfect example of love, period. He is love. His very character is love. The salvation is the gift that God gives us and so that when we are seeking our Heavenly Father and we're truly wanting to have some peace in our life that as we are being tested and as we're having a difficult time trying to figure out what to do that we can have a peace in our souls to know that irregardless of how things turn out there is life waiting for us all because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. Hallelujah. It is the cross. See, sin will not be judged only in the end. Jesus Christ is not coming back to take on sin. Did you know that? Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. Amen. He came to the world and defeated sin. Praise when he comes back, he's coming back because of you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He's coming back because you're wanting him to. He's coming back because you're waiting for him to come. See, we always try to make it sound like that Jesus coming back is this eschatological nightmare. No, it is a good thing. It is the yearning of the saints of God. Jesus, come quickly. <coughs> Please come back. He's not going to come to defeat sin. He did that. Yes, he did. 2,000 years ago, he's coming to claim his people. Yes. That's a wonderful thing. Yes, it is, preacher. Amen. That's something that we really need to think about when everybody's out there talking about Doomsday and they're putting on YouTube and all these different channels. Oh, well, here's the sign, or I had this dream, and this dream told me this was going to happen, and that's going to happen. And then we all sit there scratching our heads and say, oh, my goodness, I better run to the store and buy a 50-pound bag of pinto beans. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that tribulation isn't coming. Don't misunderstand me. The Bible teaches us it is. In fact, maybe what we're going through now is just a precursor of preparing us to see if we're ready for it or not. Have you thought of that a little bit, at least, quietly? 
Have you wondered? I'm not saying suffering's not coming, but what I am saying is this. The victory has been won. The devil cannot defeat you. Yes, that's right, preacher. Preacher. He doesn't have the power to do it. He can lure you away where you will defeat yourself. But he himself does not have the power to defeat you, cast you into hell, or have dominion over you. Now, he's powerful, but only Jesus has the gift of life and death. And he will bring life to those who love Him. Christians, stop being frightened. Stop living in fear. The God that created all things is the same God that is here right now today. Yes, sir. Irregardless of what's happening in the world. Irregardless if I live one more week or not. He is the King Amen. of all things. He is the Lord of all people. He is the Redeemer. He is the Christ that came to take away the sins of the world. Don't lose sight of that. Don't allow the traps of the devil to lure you into indifference and neglect so that you will lose what is at stake, and that is the salvation of your soul. You read over further in the Hebrews, it says salvation means exemption from the eschatological punishment. In 9.28 it says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Just what I said a little while ago. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Hold fast, Christian. Continue to believe and trust God. I know it's hard at times. I know. But the more you do it, the stronger you will be. Yes, sir. Trust Him. God is in charge. He is still sovereign. He is still the creator of all things. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting, here's what the Bible tells us, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day of Christ approaching. We need to be encouraging one another right now, not hiding from one another. We need to be telling one another, hang in there. Let me tell you what I read in the Bible this morning. Let me pray for you, brother. Let me pray for you, sister. I can do it over the phone. Let me encourage your spirit. When you hear someone that is really down and somebody that is struggling with life, encourage them, church. Be the voice of God to them. Let them see the church alive, not dead and closed. There is something to be said about coming together, isn't there? There really is. The Bible is speaking about it. We need that. As imperfect as we are, we need the church. Because we are the church. We need each other. If we have to make adjustments a little bit along the way, then we'll do it. There are times that the church had to hide out. There are times even Jesus hid from the authorities. But he didn't stay there forever. We need one another. I pray for these people that are in our congregation all over Maiden Lake, for those that are looking for some hope for those that want to believe again, for those that want to experience that God's presence is with you. You're not alone. You are not alone. Trust Him. Trust God. I know it's a time of testing. But Christ was tested on the cross. 
and he overcame it. And he can help you in what testing you're going through right now in your life. I know it's painful when bad things happen. We all know this. But you are not alone. And you never will be alone. For he will be with you even to the end of the age, Jesus said. Trust his word. Trust the Holy Spirit. Trust the Savior of the world who saved you from sin. And instead of hell, you have the hope of heaven. No government can give to you either one of those. Christ can give us heaven. Why? Because God loves us. And he's never stopped loving us. My question is, have you stopped loving him? Have you? Have you lost all hope and all trust in the God that you have believed? I hope not. I want to encourage you, if you have, that he is still very much here and desires for you to bend your knee again. All is not lost, my friends. Trust in him. I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to close with this. I had a good friend pass away uh, this week, a minister friend of mine. He and I have worked together multiple years in the past before I moved here. Uh, he went on to be with, with the Lord in glory. And I love this guy. He was he's so faithful. He, he went through some really hard times right here toward the end of his life. His heart disease just continued to cripple him. And his spirit was so wanting to serve and to be. I used to love to hear him preach. He was a Baptist preacher who went into a Presbyterian church and tried to save them right at the end of his life. You know? <laughs> I, I'm joking about that. I used to joke with him about it. I said, wait a minute, you're a Baptist because you're at the Presbyterian. Yeah, well, I didn't need a preacher. And they're all lost. <laughs> so, no, no, I just uh, Anyway, the name is Charles Hopkins. <clears throat> He's in heaven right now today. He died this past Wednesday night. And I want to, I, I, I was saddened to hear his passing because he truly was a, a dear man of God. But you know, I think of him now when we talk about trusting in God. He trusted God through some very difficult days. He did. They were hard. He struggled with so much. But now he has been set free. See folks, there is a time of trial and testing. There is. To lie to you and say that it will not happen. It's just untrue. It will, and it does. But you hold on to the great truth of your faith. Believe, even when you can't see. Just know there's something waiting far greater. Don't let the fear of death control your life. Trust in the one who defeated death. And he will set you free. And someday when it's all been said and done, when we're in the heavenly place, when we're joined together around the throne of the king, we will understand. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, that you came and defeated the enemy that has gripped us and paralyzed us for centuries. Free us, O Lord, of our fears. We pray, O God, that we can trust in you in these days that we are on this earth. We pray for those that are struggling with their faith. O God, encourage them this morning that you are still there, you have never left them. 
and that you still love them. For those who are struggling with events in life and they just feel like all the things in their life is falling apart, oh Lord, you are the rock of our salvation. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The events of this earth, the hardships of these times, do not budge your love for us. Bless us, O oh God, as we face a new week, that we can, in the face of uncertainty, trust in you. And give us some peace in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you all. Go forth. Serve him well until we meet again.